Welcome to a new episode of the Art Astra podcast. Today we have with us um, Professor Tung Shen. Um, he is an assistant professor at the Department of History of Columbia University, and he is an historian of the Ottoman Empire, focusing on intellectual, cultural, and political history. And he has uh, done a lot of research on the astrological practices at the Ottoman court. His PhD, uh, titled Astrology at the Service of the Empire, Knowledge, Prognostication and Politics at the Ottoman Court, uh, 1450 to 1550, uh, discusses a lot of these. And then he has other papers on the topic, which I will list in the description of the video. So welcome to the podcast. Um, well, thank you so much for having me, Luis. It's a well, pleasure. It's, yeah, it's a pleasure for me also to have you. We've, I've recently heard you talk at the, a conference at the Warburg Institute in London recently uh, on a very interesting topic, exactly, you know, this practice of astrology. So I would start, you know, to to do the question I always do in this podcast, which is how did the history of astrology, how do you cross paths, you know, with the history of astrology while mm -hmm. you're, you're in your studies? Uh, well, uh, it's, it's a pretty difficult question for me to answer because as you mentioned, uh, I was trained primarily as an Ottoman historian and I didn't have uh, much background in the history of astrology or history of science. But there is one simple question that really triggered my scholarly interest um, even from the, those days when I started or when I decided to be a historian. And that simple question was, I mean, what did the individuals living in the past think about their future? Uh, are there any textual artifacts that we can trace in, to understand what these individuals were really um, you know, discussing when they had ideas about the future. So uh, I first started um, looking at the dream narratives. So it was while I was doing my MA thesis back in Turkey, and I looked at some um, dream accounts, dream narratives written by both elites and ordinary individuals. And there are plenty of such sources um, that the Ottomans left behind. Uh, so this is the time when I wrote my MA thesis in Turkey, and then I decided to look at some sister disciplines or, you know, similar texts that might be useful for me to delve into that question. And that's how I slowly moved to astrological texts, because I thought that would be really um, a rich area that I could find glimpses uh, of evidence for that kind of interest. So that's how I um, arrived in, in the history of astrology. Mm -hmm. And I went to Chicago to do a dissertation, to write a dissertation on that topic. Uh, but then, <laughs> you know, due to what I was able to find in these sources, I had to reframe my um, interest um, and I ended up writing a dissertation on what astrology as a discipline as a science looked like mm -hmm. in the Ottoman context in the late medieval and early modern Ottoman context and how it was practiced by its experts um, so yeah I mean this is the short story behind <laughs> my interest in the history of astrology Again, I'm uh, trained particularly as an Ottoman historian. Okay, okay, and and you come basically from the history of culture. I, I yes, absolutely, history of culture, history of mentality is, um, and even you know literary culture because I I'm also very much interested in why people wrote things and why they wrote things the way they wrote them. Uh, 
Yeah, because uh, uh, I've been talking with, with a lot of uh, scholars and researchers and uh, astrology, uh, although the project itself, the Astro Project, is focused on the history of science, the perspective of the history of science, astrology, you know, can be explored from cultural, literary, political, you have a vast range, it's everywhere. And, and this is one of the things um, uh, I want also to, to mm -hmm. by presenting this research and various researchers like such as yourself, is to uh, show people that historically astrology is embedded in almost every human activity uh, mm -hmm. in, in the pre-modern world. Well, perhaps still today, but uh, we're talking about history here, not not current <laughs> current affairs. Um, well, having yeah. said that, I need to also add that, you know, uh, yes, I was primarily interested in the literary cultural aspects of astrology more, but uh, I also had to do a lot of work uh, for learning the science itself. I mean, because I was trying to understand how the astrologers were practicing their business. Yeah. And, you know, in order to understand that, I had to have uh, some basic understanding of their science. Uh, I still can't practice astrology, but I have some very basic uh, understanding of what yeah. the science uh, looked like back yeah. in the day. Well, from from what I read of, you, of your of your PhD, uh, I think you managed quite well to make a summary. It's reading. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because um, it is a, it is a very technical subject, you know. With I think people are used to approach it, or at least experience, you know, the the future telling aspect of it. You know, the more popular future telling, but then there is a, a, a very complex uh, technical uh, expertise Absolutely. Absolutely. behind <laughs> all of that. And I think uh, their expertise is not just about the future. I mean, I tend to define astral experts or astrologers as masters of time and this is something some early modern european historians of science also use as a category i remember anthony grafton for example i mean uh, in his book on cardano he yeah. characterizes him as a master of time because time is their ma main unit of uh, analysis and examination and it just it, it's not about future but it entails all other aspects of temporal yeah. calculation yeah. an interpretation of time and, in, and interpretation an interpretation yeah. interpretation of time yeah yeah i agree with you there it, it is uh it has that um qualitative uh, mm -hmm. element mm -hmm. Which is also the more abstract or you know less um, mathematical aspect to it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I was very interested in in what you wrote, of course, but uh, also what you said uh, on the on the conference uh, I attended, uh, which was you have uncovered uh, a lot of interesting information on. The factual daily, you know, routine of an, a court astrologer. Basically, you've been working with court astrologers uh, in your main research, uh, which I thought was it's very, very valuable uh, information because, in the European context, as far as I know, and I'm, I'm not aware of all sources available, but we do have a lot of assumptions of what a court astrologer would do um and how he was in engaged in court affairs and what the positions they occupied but very rarely we have paperwork uh, to prove it you know we have the the court physicians who were also court astrologers and we we do have the evidences for that but it's very vague you never have defined uh structures while in the ottoman empire in the documentation you uncovered you can see that those definitions very well laid out um uh, that's true uh because i mean ottomans were uh, able to i mean for those of our listeners who may not be that familiar with ottoman empire i mean they created a pretty bureaucratic and i'm using bureaucratic in quotes here because it's it's not maybe meaningful to speak about the highly bureaucratized empire in the early modern context due to 
certain absences or lacks of technology or infrastructure or etc but they were still able to establish a very bureaucratic structure mm -hmm. uh, that left behind um, you know the massive paper trail mm -hmm. uh, and they were good at administering um, expertise that's what i think is very um characteristics of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ottoman um, administrative slash bureaucratic structure. So they had particular offices for yeah. physicians, for example, for yeah, yeah. astrologers, for architects, engineers, etc. And these offices, I mean, I call them offices without walls mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's not always easy to uh, detect this spatial, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Um, character of these offices yeah but yeah. they were uh, you know they left behind a um, massive amount of sources that help us reconstruct those petty uh, experts filling mm -hmm. the offices um, in that sense uh, studying history of astrology or history of astrologers in the Ottoman context is uh, is a kind of privilege in terms of these extant written sources. Written exactly. Exactly. But of course, not all astrologers were that talkative. Uh, I mean, you can find these traces of emotions or, you know, complaints about things when you encounter a very embittered uh, astrologers. Because when they were embittered, they just sat down and, <laughs> wrote, uh, you know, wrote about their uh, pains, troubles, you know, competitions with other experts. Uh, so I wish I had more such stories uh, uh, coming down from the Ottoman context. But still, we have we have some. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that uh, the particular astrologer I talked about during that conference um, struck you. <laughs> yeah, it does, because it, it's very rare to have such a personal narrative where you have the opinions and you have the the the, the insatisfactions he had yeah. with, with his position and, and his job. That's, that's, that is very, very, very interesting. Um, and I think one of the lackings, you know, I think the history of astrology um, academically has focused mainly on European sources. I mm -hmm. think that that's where the, the bulk of things is. Perhaps we could say that for a lot of <laughs> historical <laughs> historical fact and uh, studies, but uh, it is interesting to have this, this component also um, because we see... Um, we see all the heritage that's coming from the Arab world uh, mm -hmm. into Europe, you know, during the medieval period. Um, then the European intellectual process, you know, adapts that and produces their own specific work throughout the 14th, 15th century and then 16th. But we always forget that astrology continues elsewhere, you know, even if there's no direct connections, there are there are still traditions that are moving forward. Uh, in other mm -hmm. in other areas of the world in other cultures in other uh, powers and that's very rarely you know explored or properly explored and i think what you did is also is showing us another reality which in fact is not that far from europe you know there, there's a lot of connection there of course there is this bitter enmity you know at that period but um you do have um a new cultural context and sometimes what i thought uh, was refreshing is to see it in a non-christian um, environment because all of the european um, astrology of the early modern period not so much the medieval but especially the early modern period is very much constricted by the church and all the laws that the church is imposing to astrological practice while in the ottoman empire Probably there are also uh, religious restrictions. I'm sure there are always some some kind of religious restrictions on that regard. But my sense was that it's more freely practiced 
it has more freedom of practice than uh, we see it in Europe at exactly the same period. Um, uh, do you have this view or do you think? No, I think uh, what you uh, just mentioned is pretty accurate. And I fully agree uh, with what you said that, you know, uh, history of astrology was done primarily with a Eurocentric focus, uh, not paying particular attention to how it was practiced in non-European, non-Western circles. But it's, of course, not just, the, you know, the fault of European historians, because they, by nature, are not able to work on sources written in different languages. So uh, I think it's more a problem or the fault of um, Ottoman historians or uh, historians of sciences in the Islamic context because they didn't pay enough attention to these sources due to many reasons that we can maybe talk about. Yeah. Uh, history of science has been treated in a particular way since late 19th, early 20th century in the Islamic context. Uh, so it's okay to uh, you know study history of astronomy or mathematics or the so-called positive sciences but not um, the so-called wretched subject the wretched, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was pretty dominant in the historiography of science in in the islamic world um, uh, but to come back to your question whether uh, astrologers were treated uh, more liberally um, mm -hmm. and there um, um, and I would say yes um, but still um, you know uh, every now and then one can come across a particular religious scholar or a, a kind of a, a person with some Sufi leanings, mystical leanings, saying some bad words about astrologers. I mean, yes, astrologers were practicing their business in the Ottoman context or in the broader Islamic context, but they were not the most liked figures of their times from the lens of the religious authorities. Uh, there was no such institution in the Ottoman context as Inquisition. Yeah. Uh, repressing the practice of particular um, sciences, but still, uh, I mean, uh, there are fatwas issued by uh, certain religious authorities in the Ottoman context, uh, outlaw, I mean, not outlawing, but expressing their disdain of uh, uh, astrological business. Yeah. I mean, there's a famous story about the Istanbul Observatory uh, which was established in late 16th century, more or less the same time when uh, Tycho Brahe established his own observatory in Denmark. And after a few years, the observatory in Istanbul was de demolished by a fatwa of uh, the chief religious authority at the time. We don't know the exact details of that story, unfortunately, uh, but you know, uh, the business of astrologers uh, was often uh, disdained and, you know, despised, and that played a role, I believe, in the destruction of this observatory in Istanbul. Yeah, I think we see various versions of mm -hmm. that kind of attitude throughout history, uh, both European, uh, mm -hmm. Islamic at world and elsewhere, I suppose, you know, where there's, a, there's I, I that. Think, I think anti-astrology or anti-astrologer polemics uh, are pretty widespread, not just in medieval or early modern European context, but also in the medieval and early modern Islamic context. I mean, we have so many uh, theologians, jurists, judges saying some nasty things about the monadjims, the astrologers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's something that plagues astrology throughout history. You know, that's clashed with with mm -hmm. religions, with belief, with philosophy. Yeah. yeah. But we despite see. all those criticisms, astrologers found a way to do their practice. I and I think that's the, the really most important mm -hmm. part. I mean, how could they keep doing the business 
which was, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not the favorite of the society at the time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And do you see any? Well, can you distinguish? Perhaps this is a difficult question, and I'm not sure if there's a clear answer for it. But is there any? differences you see in the the ottoman practices of astrology in this period you study with for say the european ones which are more research or at least there's more historiography on that anything noticeable on when i first started doing this research i had put some particular expectations uh, and i wasn't able to find uh, some of the sources i was <laughs> Uh, looking forward to find in the Ottoman context. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons why I chose 15th and 16th centuries is that this was the time when all sorts of millenarian apocalyptic currents were on the rise across Eurasia. I mean, uh, it was one of the salient features, I believe, of um, of the society and culture and there were all sorts of expectations about the end of end of history end of times and this coincided with the islamic millennium i mean or the end of the first islamic millennium so i was hoping to find debates on that aspect i was hoping to find astrologers um, writing on that uh, i mean for example, the famous flood or uh, conjunction of 1524. I mean, there is a huge debate um, in Europe at the time. Um, thanks to, of course, the print culture, there were numerous pamphlets uh, written by astrologers on how flood was associated or the expectations about that great flood was associated were associated with um, the expected great conjunction, uh, and I was hoping to find similar stuff in the Ottoman context, but I couldn't find any. Mm -hmm. um, and also about the end of the millennium in 1590 to 1593, uh, I was hoping to find astrologers involved in that kind of debate but nothing at all so that was a bit surprising for me um, and that was a bit disappointing i have to say um, so uh, that's the main difference i should say about uh, the role of astrology in the 16th century european context and the role of astrology in the 16th century ottoman context Mm -hmm. And there are further absences or lacks, of course, and some of these absences are pretty related to the print culture. Uh, because print technology was not fully adopted in the Ottoman context. I mean, they were aware of printing and there were printing houses uh, established by non-Muslim subjects of the empire, but the majority of the society um, was not informed of uh, printing technology uh, and that absence i think had um, certain implications uh, because in the european context we can see a boom of particular astronomical astrological texts like almanacs for example i, I think almanacs were the best sellers of the 16th century european um, markets uh, and the Ottomans were, or Ottoman astrologers were producing almanacs each and every year, but we don't have that mass amount of uh, surviving almanacs due to the absence of printing, uh, printing technology. You don't, you, we don't, you don't have that popularization, that over popularization of the topic and. Uh discussions absolutely absolutely i mean i wish i could trace how the readers for example um read those prognostications in yearly almanacs but unfortunately we don't have that many surviving copies of annual almanacs uh, 
just one or two at most from each year and they were preserved in the palace mm -hmm. uh, which means that they were the presentation copies of uh, the nice. chief court astrologers with very little marginalia or readers uh, you know meditations yeah. so that was also a little bit uh, disappointing in terms of these differences between 16th century practice of astrology in the European context and that of the Ottoman. And how do, how do these almanacs circulate? It's through printing or, or it's a manuscript? No, I mean, no printing at all. Okay. Uh, it was, it was uh, mainly through manuscript culture. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that which makes... I mean, there are some anecdotes that people were uh, reading uh, almanacs, but um, unfortunately, we don't have any extant almanac out there that contains a lot of readers notes yeah they probably discarded them because these are ephemeral objects yeah exactly even the printed ones uh, yeah. sometimes yeah. we don't have copies of certain mm -hmm. years because none survived i would think this the equivalent with newspapers nowadays you know absolutely yeah. you don't really keep them unless you're an institution devoted to that kind of uh, preservation process you yeah. But of course, the chances are higher to find traces of readers in the European context because hundreds of thousands of copies were made in Europe, whereas in the Ottoman context, we have maybe tens at most that were uh, manually compiled by the court astrologers. Yeah, yeah. So much, much lesser circulation. And... Um... What about the production of new um, new astrological materials? Uh, in the sense, not not the almanacs or not the prognostication, but of books, primers, because um, I'm comparing with Europe, more or less in the same period, we certainly have also a boom in publications. Of course, printing culture has a lot of influence on it, and the if they if it if it's absence or it's it's not as strong uh, in the Ottoman context, you will see uh, automatically you will see the difference, but. How about the production of new books, new manuals? Um, do you have any idea what are the sources that they're using at this period? I mean, it depends on the particular period that we're interested in. I mean, some decades or some periods uh, are much more receptive to uh, the expertise of astrologers and some were not that receptive. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, when I looked at the hundred or more years of astrological practice in the Ottoman context from the mid 15th through the late 16th century, the late 15th, early 16th century is the time when the, we can really speak of a boom in terms of um, astronomical and astrological production uh, because of uh, the uh, particular interest of a, a sultan. Uh, my favorite guy, Bayezid II, who really um, was interested in not just supporting astrologers, but also learning the craft itself. Um, I mean, he was studying um, the mathematics and astronomy behind it. And he was surrounded by a group of um, astral experts. And he is the guy who probably initiated this routinization of uh, astrological expertise creating the office itself uh, so in, in his time yes there is a boom in in the way astronomical tables were produced in the way earlier copies of texts were in circulation yeah. um, almanac genre flourished uh, but we don't see that level of interest in some other periods. For, for instance, during the mid 16th century, uh, the time of Suleiman the Magnificent, I mean, many tend to think that, oh, he is uh, the, the most famous Ottoman Sultan. It was the heyday of the Ottoman Empire. It must be also a good time for astrologers. But in fact, it was not the best times for the astrologers because the Sultan was not that much interested in, as far as I can see. Um, so, uh, 
I mean, there is still a production of almanacs. There is still a production of astronomical or treatises on astronomical instruments, but there is a, you know, um, a slowing down of, um, of uh, the cultivation of the science and the circulation of, of texts. Mm -hmm. uh, and it again changes by the early 17th century or by the late uh, 17th century, depending on again the interests of uh, the patrons. Exactly. In the, absence, yeah. in the absence of print culture and in the absence of a readership community or relative absence of the readership community, patronage was the only way for uh, the astrologers uh, to do their business yeah to, to to earn and to have the, the means to to to, to produce absolutely. new work yeah of absolutely course. yeah yeah i can imagine that being you know the main motivator uh mm -hmm. in such a context yeah because there uh, wasn't any other institutional framework that they could survive i mean uh yes there were madrasas which were uh the primary institutions of learning but madrasas were not places for monadjims to, you know, to learn their sciences and to practice their sciences. I mean, madrasas were just for teaching and learning um, the so-called religious sciences or legal uh, or jurisprudential matters. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a certain absence of institutional mechanisms for the practice. Yeah. The astrologers, I, I I I do see some resemblance, you know, at least on the information we have, because um, my research has taken me to the teaching of astrology uh, mainly uh, in the last few years, and mm -hmm. the fact is, although we assume that it is taught in universities, and in some cases we do have, you know, the the evidence that that is so, but. If we really look at the what we have of information, it's very little. How how would uh, let's say the uh, European, you know, someone going to to the to the schooling process would learn astrology? So there is a strange mixture, uh, at least in 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 the cases I've seen between an official learning of some sorts that it's not uniform throughout throughout mm -hmm. Europe, and also. Um, probably tutors or learning with other astrologers, you know, getting people who practice it to teach them as well. Uh, I think there is a mix here. So it's not completely in the official uh, system. Um, and uh, in, in, in your case, what evidence did you found? Because you said the madrasas were not the point, the, the, were not the main focus of, of this kind of learning. So how do you think, it, where would they learn? Do you think you would they would have some kind of tutors, masters, uh, some kind of um, mm -hmm. system like that? I mean, uh, the off the administrative office that I uh, talked about in the beginning of our podcast uh, was, I think, the primary mechanism for the transmission of this knowledge. Okay. I mean, there was a chief court astrologer and uh, that chief court astrologer had particular assistance uh, and their master and disciple relationship I think was the way the science was uh, studied um, uh, in the Ottoman context. And I have some manuscript evidence. I mean, when I trace certain um, colophons or ownership statements in, in these manuscripts, I was able to find a, 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 a menedjim or an astrologer who learned or who says that he learned this science at the hands of the chief court astrologer at the time. Okay. Uh, aside from that, uh, the informal social circles, uh, again, the circles where this master and disciple relationships were established and maintained, uh, were the main mechanisms for the transmission of astrological knowledge. Mm. I mean, in the madrasa structure, uh, one may come across certain lecturers or instructors who showed some interest in the science but it's pretty marginal i have to say uh, and it was i mean they were not offering uh, courses on astrology um, 
based on a curriculum. I mean, they were doing yeah. it as extracurricular activities for those who are interested in learning about these yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. So not not exactly an organized uh, yeah. Yeah, system. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think in Europe we kind of have the same, but we do have the universities and other teaching institutions that pop up and sometimes carry that, that flag, mm -hmm. uh, which make it a bit different but i do think at least the current evidence is show there is a lot of apprenticeship uh mm -hmm. system in place to to learn astrology even in europe where you do have you know institutions where you could officially learn the topic yeah it's, that's that's interesting and um one question um before i forgot because i want to really do this one and in the terms of development for for Europe, the 17th century, you know, the, the end the, the end of the 17th century shows also the death of astrology in the sense that it comes out of the starts to coming out of the official academic um, environment. It starts to be you know discredited in terms of its scientific reputation or, or functioning. Um, how does it work in, in the Ottoman context? Do you have any information on that? Uh, or it's a little bit beyond your your range of, uh, of research? Well, I have to say that uh, there is no official end to uh, the business of astrology in the Ottoman context, because the office I uh, keep referring to, uh, the office of chief court astrologer, uh, survived until the very end of the Ottoman Empire in 20th century. Uh, so up until 1924, there was um, somebody who was appointed as the chief court astrologer who was charged with uh, submitting almanacs with prognostications or calculating auspicious times before a particular imperial enterprise was in question. Um, so uh, it was more resilient, I have to say, in the Ottoman in the in the Ottoman context. But again, there were times that were uh, more favorable to astrologers, and there were times that were not that favorable to astrologers. Uh, it's always a fluctuating thing in the broader scheme of things in the long history of the Ottomans. Uh, but there was no official end of uh, the practice of astrologers, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, which is interesting. And again, showing how how different it is in different cultural uh, and political settings. Uh, and interestingly, uh, what happened in the 16th century European context, thanks to print technology, also happened in the late 19th century Ottoman context because this was the time when so many uh, printing presses uh, were established and there was a boom in the uh, you know uh, production of almanacs uh, uh, in the Ottoman context written by different astrologers or those with an expertise in these sciences. Yes, not all these almanacs had prognostications or astrological elements, but many uh, actually had. So uh, it would be more accurate, I think, to compare 16th century European context with 19th century Ottoman context in terms of uh, the printing technology and its implications for the popularity of these genres and disciplines. Yeah. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And I was thinking, for example, we do have the 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 Hindu context where astrology is still practiced today, with you know, with no real change. It doesn't have these moments where it falls from from popularity, at least. So it, it is always case, interesting. Yeah. I think it's also the case in Turkey. I mean, there are so many practicing astrologers. I mean, it's of course a question whether the type of astrology these practicing astrologers do in the 20th or 21st century context is the same with uh, mm -hmm. the type of astrology practiced in the early modern or medieval yeah. context. Yeah. But because... more and more uh, practitioners of astrology today are interested in um, um, the traditional or you know the medieval and early modern roots of uh, astrology and I I uh, 
recall quite a few uh, astrologers today in Turkey who showed an interest in the history of um, their uh, expertise in the medieval and early modern context. Yeah, yeah. I think that there was a revival uh, late 20th century. We, we witnessed a revival of a new interest for, for that kind of um, tradition to, to understand the tradition. I think that's an ongoing process. I think globally uh, it has been like that. And uh, it's good because people then are, are you know, reconnecting to their, mm-hmm. to their mm-hmm. culture, really, <laughs> cultural roots uh, and understanding how, how things evolved. Uh, and this is interesting because we're going to have different developments, different timings, different cultural processes with all this. You know. Mm-hmm. So it's it's quite interesting. I, I don't think, and I don't think um, a proper study has been made. You know what happens to astrology after um, its downfall, let's say, from the scientific uh, environments in Europe. We have a very fragmentary um, studies or or geographical, very limited, uh, usually to the. Uh, to England and and the Anglo-Saxon context, um, mm. but I think this is for cultural history, of course, not not history of science certainly. Uh, but I think it would be a worthy uh, study to make and understand how it changes, how it shifts, and um, how it Absolutely. survives until today. Of course. Absolutely, and I think it's the same for. Again, I'm not just speaking about the uh, narrower Ottoman context, but the broader Islamic context, you know, the historians of science in um, um, Islamic culture didn't pay much attention to how, for instance, those astronomical tables were used by astrologers, because these were the primary tools that the astrologers relied upon when making their own calculations before uh, making their own interpretations. Uh, But we don't really know uh, how they use those instruments, uh, toward what purpose they used, but it's been changing and it's going to change, I think, in the next decade or so, because more and more people are interested in that sort of question. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I've, I've noticed the same, you know, there is this finally we have seen a recognition from people who studied the tables the instruments Mm -hmm. and all that those instruments for the most part have an astrological use Uh, absolutely why do you want to know the positions of mars or or venus it's not for calendrical purposes for sure Mm -hmm. you don't need that so it has another purpose Mm -hmm. Uh, and i think now that is being more accepted uh, while let's say in the older historiography still with that very positivistic you know uh-huh. view on things you would put astrology under the under the rug you know you yeah. don't want to touch that that kind of thing you know the, the, so the, the famous wretched sciences um and i think now things are changing uh and people are recognizing you know, the context you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it will be interesting to see that in various backgrounds um, because we do have a common in terms let's say who study European traditions and who studies um, the um, Arabic and and uh, Islamic traditions there is a common root because you know the sources are flowing through 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 the through the Islamic uh, context uh, to till, till late in the Middle Ages um, and then there's a branching out but uh we still need to learn that process in both sides to to understand exactly Absolutely. what's Absolutely. going on you know how how this is going to be processed for by different cultures and historical contexts so i think there's a lot to be done <laughs> still <laughs> on the topic uh for the next uh, uh years um so let me also ask you so you are in the process of publishing your research, uh, you have published, of course, several papers, but um, and you have uh, your, your thesis is available uh, uh, for mm-hmm. those who want to read it. But you're now working on a book uh, based on your thesis, right? Do you want to talk a little Correct. bit about yeah. your, your ideas on that? Whatever you want to, of course. Now, I'll be delighted to talk about it. Um, 
I mean, in the dissertation process, I was more interested in uh, the science itself, the discipline, how astrology um, looked like. Uh, but for the book, I uh, reframed my uh, narrative and I put more emphasis on the practitioners themselves, uh, the astrologers. And I thought it would be a better way for me to delve into certain questions about what expertise meant in the early modern context uh, and who were the experts by the way and how were they um, you know qualified or credentialized in the absence of certain credentializing mechanisms because we tend to think that expertise is a very modern concept we can't think or talk about expertise prior to the 19th century um, when so many technical schools were established, um, you know, certificates, uh, training programs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in fact, we can speak of expertise in earlier periods too. Um, and I wanted to, uh, you know, look at the astrologers from that kind of perspective because astrologers were experts of their own times. They had the necessary qualifications and skills and learning to do all daunting computations that were needed by certain people, either at the court or in, in the society in general. Uh, the astrologers had the ability to compile all these almanacs. Uh, so I'm I'm currently finishing the book I'm working on, uh, and I framed it around that question of expertise and scientific expertise through the lens of uh, through the lens of the astrologers. And I believe uh, the question of expertise also enables us to further trace uh, competition, rivalries between different types of people who each claim different types of expertise. I mean, when we think of astrology, we sometimes forget the different registers of practicing it. I mean, I don't want to uh, maybe reproduce here um, the high and low type of uh, dichotomy or classification, but I think, um, and it's also the case in the European context, or the modern European context, there were more technical ways of doing astrology and more less technical or more folk you know types of doing astrology and uh, those different groups claims of authority and expertise are not always on par um, so i believe the question of expertise in, allows us to trace those distinctions or hierarchies um, established at those times. I'm not imposing these modern hierarchies, but I'm trying to trace the hierarchies embedded within that particular uh, society and culture. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, that, I think that's that's a, a, an excellent point to explore because uh, I, I'm remembering also parts of, of my research where uh, where I actually dealt with this and. Um, we do have a lot of information on what the astrologers should know. We know we assume that mathematics, some basis of mathematics would need to be uh, mm -hmm. uh, learned to, to make the proper calculations. But again, we do have high experts of mathematics being astrologers. And we have popular astrologers who do not have a formal education, or at least not a higher one at the university level and are still practicing so what yeah. exactly you know how 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 does this come about and is there are there differences in the practice what's happening here i think it's a good question to ask and i don't think we do have the, even for the european context we do not really have that much information on that there's very few case studies where you <laughs> You, you can find that information uh, in European uh, context. The, the ones I know from, well, let's say, peninsular um, um, context is the Inquisition. 
mm-hmm. when the Inquisition, you know, trials an astrologer for its practices, then you, if you're lucky and if they do the right questions, you mm-hmm. might know a little bit about his background and where he learned things and what he's, he's, he's he doing. But otherwise, it's a blank. Yeah. Again, it's not something that will, will stay on unless, you know, some person's private paper survive for mm-hmm. a reason, but that's so random <laughs> and difficult to, to happen, yeah. And so I think, you know, yeah. Yeah. As, aside from these possible distinctions between different types of astrologers, uh, we should also um, pay attention to distinctions between different types of prognosticators or um, you know diviners because uh, when we apply that uh, framework of expertise to tracing the distinctions between let's say an astrologer and a geomancer or an astrologer and a dream interpreter i mean these categories have their own particular claims of authority and expertise to speak about let's say future and they didn't always get along well, um, especially in the courtly setting. I, I mean, uh, one of the things I was able to find is that um, uh, geomancers in particular uh, were writing uh, the harshest things about the menagems because they were probably competing over the resources and you know receiving the patronage of the sultan, and each was casting himself as Hey, I'm the real authority here of speaking about the future, not the astrologers. Mm-hmm. Um, so expertise, I think, allows us to trace those rivalries across similar but distinct categories of um, people or learned individuals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, well, the Ottoman Empire and the... the, the the context outside of Europe is much more rich in that regard, uh, because while here, you know, the geomancer, well, we do have geomancers, we do have people do, using other divinatory techniques, but again, we do have the Inquisition, mm-hmm. who is hard on, on those kinds of practices, so we don't have the same but freedom to, to explore and, and to see how these relationships develop and fully, you know, uh, when they're they're on their jobs and and trying to compete for for that niche of prognostication of the future. So I I, I think I find that very very interesting. So I'm looking forward to to read your 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 study on that, and it's also refreshing <laughs> to see you. another view, you know, uh, of of how how these uh, dynamics work. So so looking forward uh, to your. Right. I mean, it's always interesting to me that, you know, these guys in different political contexts were looking at the same sky. They were more or less using the same sources in terms of the Ptolemy corpus and astronomical tables, but they were coming up with different interpretations that speak to local dynamics or, uh, you know, uh, the imperial dynamics. I think it, that's really interesting to um, and you know, to go yeah. further, how uh, the more or less same or similar discipline was interpreted and practiced in diverse ways, in diverse uh, contexts. Yeah, I think an interesting project would be to, to gather as much prediction writings we have on a specific year or set of years mm-hmm. and try to study that, you know, on Ottoman context on Europe in several places at once and then do a full comparison of what they're talking about because I notice here for example in Portugal uh, which is the context I know better in terms of that kind of prognostication they always have something to say against the Arabs because uh-huh, uh-huh. of course it's it's a must in in that so whatever the predictions they're doing it's always the defeat <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Arabs, even if it doesn't make sense for the rest of the whole prediction, that's always there as a possibility. Mm-hmm. That's they always have arguments against it, and I'm sure on the other side you also have. We're going to have the opposite argument as well because it's a political stance. Uh-huh. 
that is quite fitting to, to, to the cultural context and to the political context where they are inserted. But I would be curious to see, let's say in the more broader sense of predictions, if they are looking at the same things, if they're more or less reaching a consensus or not on, I don't know, meteorological predictions, you know, something a bit more wider that they all could or supposedly would be agreeing on. I have my doubts, of course, because <laughs> these things are always tainted by, mm -hmm. by, by one's cultural perception, but I do think it would be interesting at some point to no, absolutely. That, yeah. That experiment. We need, yeah, we need a broad team of experts who can, uh, you know, trace those sources in different uh, political contexts. Yes. Yeah. So instead of uh, looking at these sources in a fragmented sort of nature, we really need to get together, come together. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm curious, for example, how the comet of 1577 was interpreted in different contexts because it was observed by so many different astrologers in the diverse uh, areas and exactly yeah. every and one of them wrote something about it yeah the novas the novas yeah. which were quite yeah. visible and, and it's a mm -hmm. very surprising uh, unexpected phenomenon uh, at Absolutely. that period and of course the great conjunctions that they're all mm -hmm. observing in one way or another i think those could be good things to pinpoint and and then gather the corpus and do yeah. a good, good group study on that. And, well, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> we can start that project sometime. That would be very, very interesting and very well, very worthy to, to check the differences and understand. Absolutely. Absolutely. How they're handling the same situations. Yeah. Thank you. Now, um, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Uh, no was a pleasure to 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 have you here uh, also speaking about the context which i think it's the first time we're talking in the in the in the astro uh, podcast um uh, i hope i'm delighted to be here Luis. thank you so much for this lovely conversation yeah it was great and i, I hope to have you in the future for another another topic perhaps one of these researches or once your book comes out uh, uh, to to discuss it i, I would love, love to that. i'd love to yeah and well thank you uh, for accepting the invitation and well best of luck to your research and to all your academic uh, endeavors and you too and, uh, you know Luis. i know that you are uh, uh, you submitted your monograph so i look forward yeah. to reading your book when it's out I'll let you know. I hope it's still this year. Uh, with all... Inshallah. <laughs> yeah. Well, till another time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs>